The strongest bone in the human body, the femur, the thigh bone, is so strong it can withstand at least six to seven times your own body weight. And yet, take a fall from your chair just the right way and you can easily break that bone. How can something be so strong and yet so weak at the same time? We have seen in previous videos that if you have an object which is fixed at one end, like a building which is fixed to the ground, and if a force is acted upon on the other end, then to find the effect of this force, we imagine that this body is made up of a lot of planes which are parallel to that force. And what the force does is makes these planes slide past each other. So all the planes end up sliding past each other. And as a result, the building deforms and we call this deformation as shearing. And the material fights back by generating a restoring force. And if we calculate that restoring force per unit area, we call that as shear stress. And the distance that one plane slides with respect to another, which are a unit distance apart, we call that as the shear strain. And we've spoken a lot about this in previous videos. And so if you are not familiar with this or you require a refresher, it would be a great idea to go back and watch that video first and then come back over here. In this video, we're going to explore the connection between shear stress and shear strain. Now you may have already learned about Hooke's law, which states that within the elastic limits, stress is proportional to strain. And guess what? That same Hooke's law even works for shearing. So let's go ahead and write down Hooke's law for shearing. We could write now that shear stress, shear stress is proportional, proportional to shear strain, shear strain. And this just says the more strain you produce, the more deformation you give to the body, the more stress it will generate to restore itself back. And now the proportionality can be replaced by a constant which we call as the modulus of elasticity. And that modulus of elasticity over here for shearing, the letter we use for that is G, and we call that as shear modulus. Shear modulus. It's also called as rigidity modulus. Rigidity modulus, and we'll learn, we'll learn in a little while why it's called so. All right, so let's get some feelings for what the shear modulus is telling us. First of all, the units of shear modulus. Notice that the strain has no units, just like any strain. Uh, it is unitless quantity. So the modulus of elasticity must have the same units as the shear stress, right? And again, this is true for all moduli of elasticity. They have the same units as stress. And so the units would be newtons per meter square. Newtons per meter square. And now let's see what this value of G is telling us, all right? If G is very high, if G is very high, what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that uh, for a very small shear strain, like a strain like this deformation, the shear stress produced, the restoring force per unit area produced would be very high, which means the material is very elastic. It tries to snap back very quickly but it, it's also telling us that it's extremely hard to deform it, right? Because if the stress produced is very high, it becomes very difficult to deform it. So in other words, we could say that if G is very high, the body tries to maintain its shape. It's difficult to deform it. It is behaving more rigid, right? Now what's the meaning of the word rigid? Rigid means a body which is able to maintain its shape. That's the idea behind rigidity. So higher the value of G, more rigid that body is. And that's why G is called as the rigidity modulus. So we could say that the body is um, highly rigid, highly rigid. And then you say the word rigid, what should come to your mind is maintains shape, maintains shape or resists very strongly to changes in shape. And if we go extreme and if G goes to infinity, then it means it's a perfect rigid body, right? I mean, even for a very tiny amount of stra strain, the body would produce infinite stress. So it would, be it would be impossible to deform that body. On the other hand, if G is very low, if G is very low, then it is less rigid it's easier to deform it. It resists less to changes in deformation. 
And now, if you follow this chain of thought, the question is, what, what would happen if G was zero? I want you to pause the video for a while and just think about its implication. If we say that a material has zero G value, what would it mean? What can you understand about the material? All right, it would be exactly opposite of being rigid. If G was zero, it means it's not going to resist changes in deformation at all. Now think about it, if this material suddenly had zero value of G, then even for a very tiny amount of force that I put over here, the layers would just keep sliding past each other forever. And as it keeps doing that, eventually, the whole, the whole building might deform and start flowing. Does that make sense? So if G is equal to zero, it's telling us that the material starts flowing. In other words, we're talking about fluids. So fluids have zero shear modulus, all right? So this is for fluids. Now fluids are liquids or gases and their main property is that they flow, they don't have a definite shape. Now the same thing can be said in another way. We could just say they have zero shear modulus. It would mean the same thing. And similarly solids in contrast don't flow and they have a definite shape. Again that same thing could be said by saying that they have a non-zero shear modulus. So next time, if someone asks you what's the difference between, a key difference between solids and liquids, well you can tell them the usual answer that solids maintain their shape and liquids don't, liquids flow, or you can say the same thing in a very technical, intimidating, sciencey way, you could tell them liquids have zero shear modulus, but solids, they have non-zero ones. And people would be like, whoa! All right, one last thing I wanna talk about is shear strength. So let me make a little bit space over here. So shear strength. Well remember that Hooke's law only works within the elastic limits, which means if you strain it or if you deform it too much, then the, then the deformation could even be permanent. And if the strain is extremely high, if you deform it a lot, then the chances are that the stress generated could even break the material. You know that, right? Everybody keeps saying, too much stress is not good for your body. So same thing applies here as well. So strength is just a measure of what's the maximum stress a material can handle without breaking itself. So compressive strength, for example, tells us what's the maximum compressive stress a material can withstand without breaking itself. Tensile strength, for example, would be what's the maximum tensile stress a material can withstand without breaking itself. So what do you think shear strength is? Well, shear strength is the maximum shear stress, maximum shear stress, about which the material will fracture. So maximum shear stress the material can handle without breaking itself. So the modulus tells us how elastic the material is, how quickly the material tries to snap back, how rigid it behaves, but the strength just tells us the maximum limit. You go beyond that, the material will fracture. And so strength is another thing that engineers should take care about when they're designing things. And finally, one natural thing we might want to do is to connect the properties of elasticity in shearing with tension and compression. Remember that the elastic modulus for tension and compression is the Young's modulus. So a natural question could be, is there any connection between shear modulus and Young's modulus? It turns out that there is a very complicated relationship between them. We're not gonna worry too much about that, but when you simplify it and you apply it to many material, it just happens that the shear modulus happens to be pretty much, pretty much one third of Young's modulus, which tells us that most materials are less elastic when it comes to shearing compared to compressing or stretching them, tensile. But things get really interesting when we start talking about strength, and, and this is the last thing, all right? Because strength talks about when the material breaks. Guess what, materials also have different shear strength, tensile strength, and even different compressive strength. And that brings us back to the question of bones. It turns out that our bones have very high compressive strength. 
And this is why you can stand for a long time or you can jog, you can pretty much jump, you can carry a lot of weight because in during all these times, you're actually compressing your bones and our bones won't fracture so easily under compression. But guess what? It turns out that they have a very low shear strength. Meaning it's much easier for the bone to get fractured when you shear it. And these kinds of forces our bone experiences when they get a sharp blow, like when you take a fall. And it's for that reason, sometimes you can just have a moderate fall. It doesn't feel like it's a big thing, but you may have accidentally sheared that bone. So there's a good chance you may have fractured it. And so please remember for future that if you ever take a fall and it doesn't look like it's a big deal from outside, there's a still a chance that you could have sheared the bone. And because the bone has a very low shear strength, there are all the chances of fracturing it. And so always get it checked.